Insecurity in the country becomes more alarming as over 120 people were killed by non-state actors across the country in one week alone. And the People's Democratic Party PDP experiences fresh crisis over its chairmanship zoning as members demand open contest. This is Plus Politics and I am Mary Ann Kong. The state of insecurity across Nigeria seems to be taking a turn for the worse. Last week, that is between September 24th and October the 2nd, at least 123 people, including security personnel and civilians, were killed in various attacks by non-state actors. Now, out of 123 persons killed, four were security personnel, two policemen and two soldiers while the other 119 were civilians. Most of the killings were security personnel, which were mostly carried out by bandits, which occurred in the northwest and the north central zones, and the epicenter of banditry activities. The figure for last week is the highest weekly toll in the past one month. There were less than 40 cases per week in the last three weeks. But joining us to break this down and all of the numbers and make some sense of it is Kaber Adamu, a security risk management expert, and Adewale Ademola Justice, a political analyst. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Yes, I can hear you, Ah, great. Okay, I wanted to be sure that you can hear me. I'm going to start with you, Mr. Kaber. It's interesting um, that we're having a surge in non-state actors and their activities um, more than we have ever had uh, in the country. What would you, as a security personnel, say is responsible for it? Okay, so um, the, the hundred, hundred, hundred that, uh, not, frankly, in the context of Nigeria, is not um, an increase. And I don't mean by any way to uh, not sound alarmist by, by the numbers. And I'll explain yeah. what I mean. Yeah. So we do produce um, a monthly report uh, where we analyze trends and, uh, of course, provide figures for that. The list we've had in, from the beginning of the year, January to now, has been about 600. So if you divide that 600 by the four weeks that you have in the month, it means on the average you have at least 160 percent in every month. Now, it, we've had in June, um, which is the highest number that we've had in this year alone, we had a peak of 1,032, which means for the month of June, on a weekly basis, roughly around 300 plus persons were killed in, in Nigeria. So, I just wanted to remind us of this. Um, I know the media houses that, that published uh, this report, uh, perhaps for some reason, maybe they didn't have the database that we have. Um, and so the way it was presented was, is that if there was an increase, it is worrisome, even if it's 10 people that I killed uh, in the country in, in a week or in a month. But I just thought I should lay this foundation. Um, it's not in any way suggesting an increase. Uh, of course, it's indicating the fact that insecurity is still a huge challenge in the country, just like President Buhari spoke about it during the independence um, speech, where he highlighted insecurity. Interestingly, the president, yes, did speak about the fact that, um, you know, he's doing something. He talked about recruitment into the Air Force. He talked about recruitment into the police. Um, but we're looking at what's happening now and in the interim. How do these recruitments, um, how effective can they be for us in the interim to deal with these guys? Because, again, we seem to be dealing with an issue of nomenclature here. We're calling them unknown gunmen. Uh, we're calling them bandits. But these people are terrorizing the country, different regions, in, in the different parts of the country. But we, the, the nomenclature seems to be an issue. And hence the reason why we're calling them non-state actors. But... Um, 
the president also failed to speak about the number of people who have died, the people who have been attacked. We remember that people were attacked in Kaduna. Um, and the attacks keep happening, even though the number of people killed may not be as much as, you know, we might make it. But one life lost is as, as valuable as 100 or 2,000. But the, many critics have said that the president did not in any way try to give the people a sense of belonging or, or of uh, somewhat condole with the families of those who lost their lives? Um, is that for me? Is that yes, it is for you. Me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, I, I've, I've had written in the past comment that um, every leader has to fire. Um, it's possible that uh, President Warren's style in that speech, when he referenced security, is his own way of um, showing uh, condolence and the fact that he sympathizes with uh, the people who love their life. Because of course, he could have spoken about several other things when he chose to speak about security. Of course, the expectation may be for him to mention specifically uh, those who have died and the fact that as a government, we sympathize with them and to reassure of course, in the year and that um, there will be an improvement in that area, which I think he did in, in that speech. Now, speaking about recruitment, um, I hold a view that even if we decide to have a million um, security law enforcement personnel, as long as we don't address the root causes of insecurity, then that million security personnel are not going to help our situation. Because usually, we as a country, especially the government, has to provide the foundation for the security operators to work with. Now, where you are dealing with the kind of situation we are dealing with in Nigeria, where uh, the issues of great grievances are what is driving insecurity, both political, social, and economic, exclusion as an example, sometimes real and sometimes petty. Um, not about security partners. It's about the political class taking up those issues that are dividing us and finding a way to resolve those issues, um, to reduce the grievances and the tendency for anyone who is agreed to use um, on, on local means to either sabotage the government or to cause some kind of chaos with a view to pointing a finger at the government is failing. Um, President Wari did speak about that. So what I would be more interested in, what is he, his government going to put forward in terms of policy and operational um, action, flared action, to show how that grievances, good grievances will be resolved. A good example at the moment, with the secessionist agitation in both the southeast and the southwest of the country. Now, he mentioned that the uh, those in the forefront of that those agitation have been arrested. But the idea, the dream, the spirit is still holding very strong, especially in the southeast and in some parts of the southwest. Uh, the Anambra election is being threatened by that dream. So, what is the government going to put forward in terms of peace building mechanisms? to reduce those grievances and reduce the tendency of this party to recruit from within their Greek population. And so that that's what I'm hoping to see. Uh, and I, I would have expected to have hear from that speech as an example. Okay. Mr. Dewale, let me bring this to you. Um, there are, just like okay. I asked, just like I asked um, Mr. Uh, Adamu about Mr. President's speech, and of course people also watch the body language of the president in terms of all that's been happening across the country. And I asked him, why do we think that these non-state actors all of a sudden have emerged and have become and have so much following, especially for the case of uh, Namdi Kanu and Sunday Boho, uh, who have now be, been in custody, they're now in custody, of course, uh, of, the, uh, of the DSS. The president made mention of them in his speech and has said that he's dealing with the issue 
But then he also spoke about the fact that there are people who are peddling lies and causing more divisions around and ac across the country. There are also naysayers who responded to Mr. President saying that he's part of the elites um, who have also um, brought some form of division across the country. So again, how do we deal with the issue, the foundation of these divisions that we have that have caused this non-state actors to be thrown up? For us to, because we cannot really deal with insecurity, or let me ask it as a question, can we really deal with insecurity if we do not address the reason for the insecurity in the first instance? Thank you very much. Yeah, I want to appreciate the former speaker for what they have said. I know, like you said, categorically, this is a sad thing for our nation, Nigeria. Because you will see almost all the regions of the country have their own share of this evil. Non-state actors in a legitimate nation, in a sovereign nation, is an absurdity. And like he said, this is not just a matter of the insufficiency of personnel of our security of prisons. I can make it to say it is because of the fallout of the foundation of the country. And like you said in your last expression, but it's not that the foundation is that terribly faulty. Why would it be that the non state actors have leaders whose followership is growing geometrically almost every time? It is because a lot of people have seen the nation as a failed state. And then some of the actions of our leadership, almost on a regular basis, are dovetailing towards making people a claim of an assurance that the nation has killed. Because how else, or what else would you see of a country if up north there is crisis? Moving down south, the south is, is burning. Just like uh, just some few hours ago, just yesterday, Joe Ibokwe's house was set ablaze by Nigerians. So you see, when it gets to a level when people throw away their relationship, all in a bid to throw up or to showcase or project the anger they have against the entity called Nigeria. Those that set a place and the Joy Bokweta are people around this heritage, but they disregard their relationship with him and yet went up to set up what they had on fire, just to show their anger for the nation Nigeria. So it's a failed state syndrome. And it's so sad, none of our leaders yet is able to identify with this. It is not a function of the personnel. If we have millions of millions of security operatives, if the foundation is not addressed, and the foundation, nationality, patriotism, employment, bulk of the people out there that are causing this carnage, they are jobless. And ahead of them, they can't see a future. So whoever is around them with a loaf of bread as low or as cheap as a loaf but, of bread. But how is destroying, how is destroying your own or killing your own people, if that be even the case? And, and we're talking no, about no. what's happening in the southeast. And I'm not talking about the banditry or the terrorism that's happening in the north central or in the northwest, no, they, they are all, or in the northeast. I'm, the I'm asking, family. if, if you are aggrieved with the government, how does destruction yep. of your people, the businesses, um, amount to hurting the government or getting their attention? How does that work? No, no, you see, normality is when people are still okay, mentally, physically, economically, and financially. But women, there is a misnomer in the thinking of the people, particularly through their psychology. They will throw up that that you are considering in your, in your expose. They are not interested in whether they are killing their own people, but they want to upturn the entire environment and make the whole world see Nigeria as unsafe. Do you understand? People are not considering whether they are killing their own persons or not, whether they are burning the homes of... Look at what is happening in the Southeast. Vehicles conveying food to that region will be set ablaze. Vehicles laden with uh, MRWA and uh, motorcycles, yes, set ablaze. The people just want to showcase their anger. 
you understand? It's a signal of a failed state. People mm. just want to showcase and project their anger for everybody around the world to know that Nigeria is finished. Hmm. You understand? Interesting. It's a foundational wahala. But I, I mean, yeah. I, I'm 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 interested in this this particular position that you're taking. But then I have spoken to people. Um, political analysts who have also made mention of the fact that this is peculiar to, you know, what to the build up to an election season that there's always some form of yep. unrest that leads up yep. to an election, you know, and, and they're saying that this has happened before. Although many mm. have argued also in certain quarters that this has never happened on this scale where you have pockets of violence almost everywhere in the country, everywhere. that it makes you shudder at the thought of even driving from one end of the country to the other. Yeah. So we're talking yeah. about problems here, but I always like to talk about problems and solutions. If you have, we have, I mean, you and Mr. Adamu have clearly stated that there is a problem. How do we yeah. deal with it? Because we cannot continue allowing people to die, whether we know them or yeah. not, whether the numbers are high or not. Why is yeah, government? Why is government not taking it upon themselves, not just to speak about, you know, um, recruitment of people into the force and um, the, the long arm of the law dealing with them, but why is government yeah. not dealing with the major issue, which is issue. the foundation? Yeah. See, like you said, if we shift our attention or our focus from the issues to the solution, the solutions are simple. It is simply because our leadership are yet to identify with the people. When I mention leadership, I wouldn't want everybody listening to me or everyone under the influence of my voice to think I'm talking about the president. The respective cadre of leadership we have, right from the president to the local government councillor, they are yet to identify with the people. Identifying with the people is filling their thoughts. Filling the darkness with the people, filling poor roads with the people, filling joblessness with the people, and filling abject poverty. We have a leadership now that lives and drives in Rolls Royce while the people are strolling on, barefooted on the road. So it is because our leadership is here to identify with the realities of the, of the followers. The followers are suffering in Nigeria, and our leaders are there high up. They are far away. So the main solution is for the leaders to identify with the followers and the issues on ground. Do you understand? I can hear you. Yep. Okay, I'm yep. going, to, I'm going so, to... Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yep, like I said, so until we have a leadership that comes closer, like I said, why would you have a local government chairman who refuses to live and sleep in the local government where he is the chairman? I have one in our in Ondo state. He's the local government chairman of our local government, but he lives and sleeps in Akure. It's a leadership aberration. How do you want the people to trust him? How do you want them to follow him? How do you want him to, to believe what he has in his mind, what he, what he tells them? But if he lives in the environment with them and he drives through the rough road with them and he sleeps in darkness, then they can feel what they are feeling. So we have a leadership that is separated far away from the followership. So that's a major bane of the Nigerian crisis. L let me go back to Mr. Kaper Um It's interesting that most of these people who are either non-state actors or working with these non-state actors are young people. And this is the future of Nigeria. Yep. And if our young people are the ones who are in the forefront of supporting or perpetrating these acts of violence. It, do, it should be a cause for worry. And just like uh, Mr. Demola has said, um, our leaders seem not to be leading by example. But we, the followers, do we have to wait for our leaders? Because, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going somewhere because I can hear at the back of my mind somebody saying, well, we can't victim blame the followers. But as a people, should we not also take some time to look at how we can also play a part uh, in delivering the kind of future that we want, uh, especially with our young people who are seemingly becoming, you know, um, tools in the hands of these perpetrators of violence. Yep. Am I on? Am I still on? No, no, no um, I'm talking to Mr. Adamu. 
Yeah, okay, okay. So, um, interestingly, last um, last month, or rather, well, time flies. In August, um, the African Polling Institute (API) released uh, its social cohesion report, and um, I took my time to study that report, and it showed that um, social co cohesion in Nigeria was below average. Um, around 40 something percent. I think the thing, the, the cutoff point for an acceptable social, national social cohesion is from 50 percent upwards. So, plain, showing one system that the people have almost collapsed, and that those together are part of uh, the region. Now, what are the reasons for that? Several reasons that advanced in that report. In answer to your question, the one um, I think comes to mind and that we need to speak about is the extent, the poverty level within the country. And not just the poverty level, which according to the Bureau of Statistics is about 33%, but the poverty level and the unemployment rate for youth, which depending on where you are in the country, is also different. So, as an example, in Lagos State, the poverty level is quote-unquote 4%. In my state, the high come from Sokoto State, it's about 87%. So, imagine the number of youth that are within that poverty cycle, and who, for one reason or the other, would want to move from Sokoto to Lagos to get a job. Hmm. Now, Situate that movement to the current hate messaging that is unfortunately permeating our national uh, existence, where every movement is most likely to be classified as a movement of other. Meanwhile, the reason for their movement is in search of greener pastures. But, it, but does, that not also, does that not also point to the fact that the leadership at all levels in those states um, are not doing the job that they promised to do, and not also carrying the people or lifting them out of poverty. I know government cannot do everything, but there has to be a precedence of sorts set by the government. So, so exactly, but I, I wouldn't. I, I was trying to paint a picture, and uh, the picture I'm trying to paint is to start from the family level. That value system that has collapsed. There are several levels of responsibility. And I, I painted that picture to show how the family is partly responsible. Um, if, as a father, you give birth to children that you are not able to cater for, you can't send them to school, uh, where even sometimes you have the resources, but you just don't care. And then that up to the community level, where the community also fails in ensuring that you as a father or as a family unit uh, where you feel and there is no way of sort of redirecting you back to your responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then we can even move up to the school level as well as our religious bodies that are value shapers and in the, in the case of the schools that have responsibility for both um, giving education as well as skills. So are you? I'm an employer of labor, and I can tell you with all sense of responsibility, get, getting good hands from, uh, you know, even our graduates, it, it's a very difficult thing. You see people with good certificates, but when it comes for them to defend those certificates, it's extremely difficult. Now, I'm not generalizing, because there are definitely very uh, people that are worthy of their certificates, but on the whole, there is a huge issue there. And then, of course, from there, we move up to the government. And then when we come to the government, um, both at the local government, at the state level and at the federal level, each has its responsibility. So I am trying to change the picture of um, our collapsed value system. It would be wrong for us to point the finger at, at the government and say that they are responsible. So it's a responsibility that starts from the family up to the, to the government. And I think what I'm hoping um, as we start campaigning an issue for, against 2023 that we address this issue squarely 
our value system that are starting to have collapsed and where life unfortunately does not appear to have any value, you know, like it should. Uh, we should, as, as the people ask ourselves, okay. what happened? Why is it that um, we no longer cherish good, good ethics, good values that we used to hold as the people? I remember growing up, those things that we used to cherish as a community. In fact, I remember very well, my, my, my dad was a civil servant. If a family member is caught corrupt in any way. Uh, believe me, the entire family is, um, is avoided. But today, the, the reverse is the case. All that matters is for the person to be rich. And nobody even bothers to ask how the person got rich. In some instances, they even know that he got rich to do their things, but he's still valued and given uh, some form of respect within the society at all of these levels that I mentioned. Okay. Interesting. Finally, because we're out of time, Mr. Demola, um, just as Mr. Damu has said, Yes, we have uh, an eroded culture or value system in the country. But looking forward to the future, I mean, 2023 is in the radar. Everybody is, whatever is happening, what politicians are doing is mostly, um, you know, for 2023. But as a country um, that has been touted as the giant of Africa, um, I do not know if we're still able to, you know, occupy that status. But do you see this? Um, going away anytime soon, whether it's the Buhari government or the government after, do you see us able to deal with the issues and address them head on or not? Thank you very much. Like my friend said there, the collapse of the value system of the society is a critical contribution to what we have seen. But now, assisted by the poor leadership we've been having as a people, See, if we must prefer solutions, like I do appeal to people in my personal capacity, the homes are completely broken. The value system needs to be re-emerged all over again. Parents, parents particularly, have critical roles play. And beyond the parents now, our traditional rulers have gone laggard. Because you will see we are in societies where it is the traditional rulers that are the greatest harborings of ills in the society. They support also where they ought to come out and challenge certain things. But for reasons that's known to them, our traditional rulers no longer look their side. And now back to the civil society, part of which the religious homes, the churches, and the more are they've all been infiltrated. The values have gone back to where they used to come from. People just gather, just for, just, just for gathering sake. Messages of reality no longer come to people. And now with sheer hunger, everybody becomes a sellout. And that is why we are seeing what we are seeing. Mm. Well, I want to say thank you very much. It's a very sober conversation. Kaber Damu is a security specialist, and of course, Adiwali Adimola is a political analyst. Thank you very much for joining us on this conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, we will discuss the PDP and their plans for zoning of their national chairmanship, and of course, for the presidency ticket. We'll be back shortly. Thank you.